Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 17. We're going to read these verses first, and then we'll come back and break them down verse by verse. <clears throat> it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So you remember last week we went through Romans chapter 7 where Paul was talking about <clears throat> the good that I want to do, I don't do, the evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And most people explain that as, see, if that's you, man, that, if that's you, that was Paul. That's the Christian walk. Now, that's not the Christian walk because he came to the death of himself. And you see that in verses 1 through 4. So Paul is just picking up in verse 5 with his train of thought. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Is that the man in Romans chapter 7 verses 14 through 23? Yes, it is. That was the man that was doing things after the flesh. But notice the distinction. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Now, there's many times that we have talked about walking in the flesh and what that entails. Y'all know those verses very well. Today... In verse 5, we're going to focus on walking in the Spirit. Let's focus on the Holy Spirit. If you go to Galatians chapter 5, keep a marker in Romans 8 because we're going to be coming back. So Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 22, we're going to focus on the Spirit now. What the fruit of the Spirit is. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now let's, let's go through these and really digest it. Fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy. Think about that. Think about even when you're down or you're being tested or you're being tempted. It's so easy to be joyous when things are going the way you want them to go. What about when you're getting tested? Are you joyous in it? Peace. Do we have a heart of peace? It's easy to have a heart of peace. Even in this sense, it's, it's easy for you to have a heart of peace when it comes to those that hate you. But how about those that hate you that you were really close to at one time and who have hurt you? That really hits home for all of us in here. Well, at least many of us in here. Long suffering. Long suffering is fruit of the Holy Spirit. Gentleness, goodness, faith. Think about that, being gentle. Not abrasive, gentle. Meekness, temperance, self-control. Against such there is no law. See, there's no law for those things. Now remember, we read in Romans chapter 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit has a law in the sense that he's guiding you and teaching you. But there's not necessarily a written law about these things. I mean, it is written down here to show you the evidence of the spirit. So you can test somebody's fruit. If this person is claiming to be a Christian, yet they don't have a heart of peace, they're not long-suffering with you. Gentleness, if they're not gentle with you. If they're abrasive. 
Now, there's a time for rebuke, but do you have a spirit of gentleness? Notice verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Is it because the flesh is inherently evil? No, it's because you in the past have brought your flesh into subjection to sin. Okay? And that's what it's talking about. You crucify the flesh, what you have fed it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. You're seeing the same evidence here. Forbearing one another. That's interesting. Forbearing one another. In the Greek, it means to sustain, to bear, to endure with one another. Do we do that? Are there times you get tested with, I don't want to deal with it right now. Do you forbear with your brother or sister in Christ, or are you so quick to cut them off? There's a time to cut off if somebody's spirit's off, and they don't see themselves in truth and won't repent. But do you have this spirit of forbearing with one another? Notice the next one, and forgiving one another. If they trespass against you, do you forgive them? Or do you try to find loopholes out of it to where you think you don't have to forgive? That's not fruit of the Spirit. He goes on, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. That is a commandment, and that is fruit of the Spirit. And above all these things, put on charity, love which is the bond of perfectness. And when you look at this in the Greek, it literally means perfection. See, sometimes when you see the uh, translation from the Greek word for perfection, it's di different Greek words. Sometimes it could just mean completeness. Here it literally means perfection. And they explain the state of more intelligent or moral and spiritual perfection. Now remember, that's their explanation, but I would agree with that. Moral and spiritual perfection. So if anybody tells you you can't be perfect, that's impossible, you got a problem with Scripture. Because that's in the context of fruit of the Spirit. And what is that? Verse 14. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, moral perfection. You can be perfect in Christ. James chapter 3 Starting in verse 17, it says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. So it, it's going to be pure, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. That's interesting, easy to be entreated. What does that mean in the Greek? It literally means easily obeying, compliant. They obey. So if you're not obedient, if you're not complying, that's not fruit of the Spirit. Gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's absolutely astounding to me, so many people that claim to be Christians do not see their hypocrisy. What seems to be hypocrisy? What seems to be partiality? And remember what it says in Proverbs. Differing weights are an abomination unto God. Now, you could be doing it in ignorance, but come on now. If you're judging one person this way, and then you're giving a pass to somebody that you have favor for, that's an abomination according to God. You can't do that. It's differing weights. can't do that. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Do we strive to make peace? Go ahead. It's something like I've, I've read verse 17 probably many times, but I've never seen it. Like, this really stuck out to me. It says that the wisdom uh, that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Like, there's the peace of the world, like you could just see in the LGBT community. Together, they might be peaceable, they might be gentle to one another, mm -hmm. willing to yield to one another, but they're not, it's not first pure. So right. Like, that's the first step. That's the first step. Judgment, judgment of measure. Where is, where is it from? Okay, there might be a. Like the ecumenical movement, let's all get together, but is that first pure? No, it has to be 
That's right. Wine, that that's good. Notice he does rice. make he does make that distinction. Yeah. It's first pure. There can be people that are peaceable. There can be people that are gentle. They're still sinners. Now it's got to first be pure. And how do you know if something's pure? You test it to the Word of God, because God is pure. Mankind, no man except for Jesus in the flesh, has ever been pure a hundred percent. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned, not that we continue to sin. Second Corinthians chapter six. I want to show you some of these because these are not scriptures that we have shown a lot lately. We need to see this. Some of these others we go through quite often. I just quote to you because you guys know them very well. Second Corinthians chapter six, starting in verse three. I want to get the context here. It says, giving no offense in anything. Notice that. No offense. It's amazing if you do a Bible study on stumbling block and, and uh, offense, how much you'll see that in the Word of God. Give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. In, and now he's going to list how they approve themselves as the minister of God. Here, they, here he goes. In much patience. Do you have patience? In afflictions. In necessities. In distresses. In stripes. In imprisonments. In tumults. In labors. In watchings. In fastings. By pureness. By knowledge. By long suffering. By kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. By the word of truth, by the power of God. By the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor. By evil report and good report. As deceivers and yet true. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live as chastened and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Boy, that's a long list that Paul gave there. That's fruits of the Spirit. It's totally abstract, totally contrary to the world. You guys can go back to Romans chapter 8. I'll read one last one for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 10 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Not proving what is acceptable before man, before the Lord. How do you know what's approvable unto the Lord? Well, the Holy Spirit does guide you for sure. How do you test whether or not that's of God? The Word of God. That's exactly right. The Word of God. You won't have to twist it. It'll fit perfectly. All right. Back to Romans chapter 8. So that... What he talks about there in verse 5, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's the man that you saw in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. That was not a man that was saved. That was a man in the flesh trying to do it in his own power, absent the Holy Spirit. And then the next part, they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And we just saw some evidence of things of the Spirit. So you need to test that with anybody you come across. Verse 6 for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So verses 6 through 8. You know, there's many people out there. Have you guys ever heard this before? Oh, he's just a carnal Christian. Or that you can be a quote unquote carnal Christian. Have, has anybody ever heard that before? I, I know I, I have. I want you guys to go real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to show you what they're trying to advocate for here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. 
That's right. You'll hear, oh, I'm just a saintly sinner. I'm just a carnal Christian. It's an oxymoron. Okay? That's paradoxical. You, it, that, that makes no sense. You can't be a sinning saint or a saintly sinner. There's no such thing. They're total polar opposites. But they're, they're getting it from this verse. Now remember what we just read. What did we just read in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8? That the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And he says that the carnal mind, if you're living carnally, it is death. Right? For to be carnally minded is life? No, it's death. And that's not physical death. Okay, what happens if you die with a carnal mind? You're giving into a carnal mind. You will see the second death. So now, see, this is how you do a proper Bible study. You take clear verses that say what they say. I don't care if it's on Holy Ghost, repentance, faith, baptism, tongues, anything. Take the very clear scriptures that you cannot argue out of, even though it's astounding to me that people will argue out of the clear scriptures. You take the clear scriptures and then go to something that you could see a different way or you could interpret a different way. Okay? This would be proper hermeneutics. You take the clear and match it up with something else that could be argued for differently. All right? And that's an example right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul writes and he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now, didn't we just read that that stuff is of the flesh? Yeah, it's not of the spirit. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase about God. Okay? We just read in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, for to be carnally minded is death, but yet Paul says that they're being carnal. How do we explain this? Well, let's look at the context. They're babes in Christ. Think about when somebody's a babe in Christ. Okay? They just left sin. There's a lot of bad habits and things they could be doing that maybe they don't understand it's wrong. I've actually spoken to some, and I'm not going to name, you know, even some of you on camera. I've had conversations with some of you. I've had conversations with people on the streets. There can be somebody that actually becomes a born-again Christian that is actually using profanity. And they actually don't know it's wrong. See, in the past, I would have been like, you're not a Christian. You're not right. Well, God, you just cussed. Now, am I accurate? It is true that that's sin, but what if it's sin of ignorance and they truly did not know that that was sinful? I know, I, with me, it was obvious, like when I became a Christian, I knew not to do that. But I've talked to some of you, and one of you, I won't say on record, confirmed that you did that in the beginning. And you know for a fact you were born again. There could be somebody that is literally could be smoking a cigarette. I'm not advocating for any of this. We know it's sinful. Somebody could be smoking a cigarette in the very beginning and actually not think that that's sin. I don't, I don't, I don't know how that's possible to me, but they could be ignorant. And now that is, and I'm not basing it on experiential evidence, okay? I'm not doing that. We don't want to live on experience. But when we take the totality of God's word, like John chapter 9, verse 41, when Jesus said, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. So if this person I'm talking to smoking a cigarette and he says, well, what am I doing that's wrong? Well, you're smoking a cigarette, dude. That's not right with God. You're polluting the temple. Well, show me in the word of God where it says that. Now, it's in the context of sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 3, but the principle's there. You're polluting, you're corrupting the temple of God. Why would you do that? 
And I can take you to John chapter 12, verse 26. It says, wherever my servant is, I will be also. Would Jesus be smoking a cigarette? See, you can prove to them that's not what Jesus would do. Now they have knowledge. Now they need to stop. Okay, I know it sounds astounding for some of us in here, but it's made me examine myself by be careful with what you're saying. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Did you know what you're doing is wrong? Well, I'm going into this 50 Cent concert. You saying I'm not right with God? I used to listen to 50 Cent. Why would you, are you saying you're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Would God lead you into here to listen to that? Are you entertaining yourself with that? Why would you want to listen to that? It's talking about all the things God hates, literally. So I, I, I had to slow down and at least speak to somebody and show them, do you know this? That's part of the reason I believe that God had us take a break from preaching for a while, to be fair, to, to, to examine what we're saying, not to just judge off the bat, maybe somebody was ignorant. Okay? So... What I would argue for here is that the fact they're babes in Christ. Now, I'm not saying none of them were doing this willfully. I do, obviously, they were doing it willfully, you know, intentionally, in a sense. But maybe they didn't understand that there was sin involved in it. Maybe the, in the church they were like, well, I, I got the gospel from Paul, man. Paul was called by Jesus. Well, Apollos gave it to me. Well, well the apostle Peter, he knew Jesus. Maybe they were doing that. And maybe in their ignorance, they didn't know that was sinful. So Paul's rebuking them. I fed you with milk. You are babes in Christ, but you're not, you're not being spiritual here. But as on the carnal, you're babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat. You weren't able then to bear it. And you're obviously not still now able. And then he rebukes them. Are you not carnal? It's a rhetorical question. Aren't, are you not acting as carnal men? Christ's body is not divided. So stop it. It's a rebuke. So you take this, based with Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, that's why he's rebuking them. Because you're in death if you're willfully doing that. So if they continue to do it after this, when Paul has told them, there's no excuse. Just like Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses, uh, verse 22, when he said, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. Okay? Notice I gave you Bible to prove the belief. I didn't just give you my belief. All right? So hopefully that helps. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You'll see him say the same thing, kind of similar here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. We are not to have division in the fellowship in the body of Christ. You can have your opinion about something. You can have your opinion about something. Maybe you don't like guns. Maybe this person does like guns. You're on the agreement that we don't war in the flesh. We love our enemies. We don't shoot people. But guns in and of themselves is not a sin. Maybe one person stays completely away from alcohol. The other one drinks wine a little bit occasionally and never gets drunk. He has that liberty. Don't be divisive about it, right? Romans chapter 14, verse 1, not over doubtful things. So we need to speak the same thing. There must be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We need to judge these things right, righteously. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Apollo, and I am of Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. We'll stop there. So, and you... I believe the reason why he's saying that is because if he would have baptized more of them, they'd be fighting over that too. Which maybe, maybe corresponds with why Jesus baptized nobody. We don't know that, but there's an argument to be had that 
think about if Jesus himself, God in the flesh, started baptizing people. You think some people might be like, Jesus baptized me. Right. High-mindedness. You know? I'm not saying that's why Christ did not do it. Scripture doesn't say. But it's something interesting to think about nonetheless. Now, you know, you'll see in verse 2 that he was writing to those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called saints. Notice I said called saints. I did not say called to be saints. Because to be is not in Greek in verse 2 of chapter 1. It's called saints. I don't know this, but maybe the translators kind of had it in their mind that, well, nobody really is saying. I don't know that. But you didn't need to add that. Why'd you add to be there? So that's why I'm saying I personally believe, given the totality of Scripture, carnally minded is death. So I would conclude they were doing these things ignorantly, being divisive about things, and Paul's rebuking it. Hey, I was informed by the household of Chloe, you're doing these things. Christ is not divided. Stop it. Okay? That's what I believe. It doesn't mean nobody had knowledge, nobody was doing it willfully. I don't know that. But I do believe, more than likely, they were doing it ignorantly because to be carnally minded is death. So let me ask you something. How much can you be carnally minded without dying? Exactly. Carnally minded is death. One. <laughs> One time. And I believe that based on the totality of Scripture because like I said, John chapter 9, verse 41, Jesus said... That if you were blind, meaning you don't have knowledge, you would not have sin. But you say you see, therefore your sin remains. So once you are aware, then it's sin. You're accounted with sin. And I gave you John chapter 15, verse 22. Jesus said, if I wouldn't have come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. James chapter 4, verse 17. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And then Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul even says, For I would not have known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet, which means knowledge. And look at verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So he died when the knowledge came. That's when he died. So I just gave you a lot of scripture to base upon that. Okay, that's how you read that. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Romans chapter 6, if you want more, verse 16, I'll read it to you. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants in the Greek, his slave, are you to whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. And that's the same Apostle Paul just two chapters earlier. Sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. And in that same chapter, verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Verse 21 says, for the end of those things is death. Sinning, the end of those things is death. So there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Now back to Romans chapter 8. Verse 8 where it says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I want you to go to Romans chapter 13. Just a few chapters later here. Romans chapter 13 starting at verse 12. He says, So then those that are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot please God in the flesh. Well, look at what it says here. Paul says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, what does it mean in verse 13, not in rioting? Well, in the Greek, it literally means revel, carousal. Think about, I'll give you a picture in your mind. Uh, think about in the past if you ever went to a Super Bowl party. Now, su uh, you know, a Super Bowl party in and of itself is not necessarily a sin, okay? 
It's not necessarily a sin to watch, per se, the Super Bowl or be at a Super Bowl party, but what's going on there? Think about a lot of Super Bowl parties. What would it be? It's like sloppy drunk, intoxication, loud, boisterous behavior. Okay. Think about when we go and we preach at the bars, right? You'll see people walking around, hey man, you saying I ain't ready with God, man? You know, they're walking around with their beer and you can tell they're drunk. That's carousing. That's reveling. Okay. That's what it is with the riding. It's riotous behavior. Okay. Notice he says riding and drunkenness. So your riotous behavior, maybe it's not drunkenness, but you're riding. Think about these. Well, I mean, like these, uh, like we've had in the past here in America where, oh, I'm mad. We're going to go out there. They start rioting. That's exactly what that is. Rioting and drunkenness. Two distinctions, but a lot of times they go hand in hand. Partying. What's that? Partying. Right. It's not necessarily, I mean, you're getting drunk, but you're there participating. Right. If you're there participating, exactly. Now, he goes on, not in chambering. See, that's, that's more like archaic language. We're not chambering. What's chambering? Well, in the Greek, it can mean a place for laying down, resting, sleeping in, the marriage bed, for example, like adultery, fornication, or cohabitation, whether lawful or unlawful. Well, obviously, it wouldn't be lawful. I live with my, my wife. That's, that's awful. But think of chambering as, hey, that's my girlfriend there. You guys live together? Yeah. We're, are you married? No. That's chambering. You're cohabitating unlawfully. You have no reason to be living with a woman you're not married to. Okay? Not in chambering and wantonness. Wantonness in the Greek, it literally means unbridled lust, licentiousness, lasciviousness. Okay? That gives you an idea. And think about that. Chambering and wantonness a lot of the times go hand in hand. Two distinct things, but they go hand in hand. All right? Not in strife and envying. The strife literally just meaning contention, strife, wrangling. And the envying meaning an envious and contentious rivalry, jealousy. All right? And jealousy in and of itself is not necessarily a sin. I could be jealous over my wife with a godly jealousy. But there's also an ungodly jealousy where I start following her around and watching her every move. That's Why would I do that? That's ungodly jealousy, like peeking over the corner, like, I, I saw some guy asking you directions. What are you doing? Right? That would be ungodly. And notice verse 14. He says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Here's the thing. Once again, that fulfill and thereof is not in the Greek. They didn't really need to add that. They could have just left it off by saying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to the lusts. In the Greek, it just means to your desires. Okay? It's not about you. It's about the Lord. So they didn't need to add that. Yeah, the Lunds letter puts it as, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and for the flesh take no forethought for desires. Right. And that's what it means in the Greek. You know, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not, you know, they, they, sometimes they add English words so it reads more smoothly. That's why the Young's literal translation doesn't read as smooth because they stick more literal and the King James sometimes adds some words. So if they do add words, I'll usually call it out for you guys. So you guys can see it. All right. Back to Romans chapter eight. Now, verse nine, he says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, notice the condition, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Let's stop for a second. It's really interesting that Paul says this. Think about it. Even with y'all sitting here, you could sit there and say, well, I'm part of Keith's fellowship. It's our fellowship, but nonetheless, yeah, okay, you're sitting under me. That doesn't mean you're right with God. Of course, if you're not right with God, I'm not going to allow you to be here until you repent. However, maybe one of you is in some kind of secret sin right now, and I don't know about it. It may take a while to manifest to where I see it on the outside. I'm not God. And that's why I notice what he says. He's talking to the saints at Rome, but he says, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. 
Just because you're in a fellowship does not necessarily mean you're right with God. Okay? You could be deceiving yourself. So keep that in mind. Which is part of the reason why fellowship is so good. Because your brother or sister may see something in your life that needs to be addressed. And you need to have the ears to listen. The Spirit's going to lead you to listen. Even if somebody's not correct, and what, listen to them. Hear them out. There you go. Bingo. Exactly right. Now notice he goes on. He says, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Some of you may be thinking, spirit of Christ? What's that? Well, it's interesting. My wife picked out the Trinity song today. I bet you didn't know we were going to have a little talk about the Trinity very briefly. Um, so many people, they, they kind of wonder, like, what's the spirit of Christ? What is that about? There, what is there, two different spirits now? The, like the, the Holy Spirit and then the Spirit of Christ? What, what, what is this about? Well, I'm going to help you guys. Okay. In fact, for y'all on YouTube, um, I may put the uh, Doctrine of the Trinity that I did a while back, I think years ago. I may put it in the description underneath this video. I would highly recommend listening to it. And the reason why I say that is because so many people that teach on the Trinity, they really do not understand the Trinity. They don't understand the triune nature of our Lord. They really don't. Um, I've heard people sound like they're oneness, that they're modalists, and they don't understand the Trinity. Now, look, we're talking about things that are very, I'm not even saying I've got, you know, I mean, we're talking about God here, okay? But I give you Bible and even what the early church fathers were talking about, not that there's scripture in those sermons. And I, I believe it would help people out immensely. So we're going to do a brief rundown today. So what is the Spirit of Christ? Well, Jesus is God, right? What does it mean when somebody says Jesus is God? Because it is theologically correct to say, Jesus is God. I've seen people do it. Jesus is God. And I'm like, yeah, I agree with that. Now, if I'm talking to them, like face to face, I would say more likely, well, what do you mean by that? I do agree Jesus is God, but what do you mean by that? Because theologically speaking, it is. Now, he is not the father. Jesus is a distinct person. Okay. So when we say Jesus is God, the correct theological term would be, yes, Jesus is God, meaning he is divinity. He is divine. Okay. I'm going to prove it with the Bible. All right. Just give me a moment. So this spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to prove it. Just bear with me. <clears throat> Before we do that, there's two other times that this is used in Scripture. You don't have to go there. I will read it for you to save some time here. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed... That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Okay, so we see in verse 11 here, it says, What manner of time the Spirit of Christ was in them did signify. In them of who? Those of old. Well, Christ wasn't in the flesh yet. So those of old, who was speaking through them? Well, we know it was the Holy Ghost. Well, Keith, how can that be the Spirit of Christ? I'm going to prove it. Just give me a moment. Okay. So you see that of them from old, because he's talking about them of old. You see the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 15. It says, But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord... Now, this is the, in the context of the Israelites being influenced by the law of Moses, and they're being blinded by this thing. Okay, so that's the context. Now, did the Israelites believe in God the Father? Yep. 
Did the Israelites that were rejecting Christ and hanging on to the old covenant, did they receive Jesus as their Messiah? No, they did not. That's why in verse 15 here it says, But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, meaning them, when it shall turn to the Lord, turn to who? They already think they're following the Lord, turning to Jesus. When it shall turn to the Lord, Jesus, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. What spirit? Spirit of Christ, i.e. also Holy Ghost. And where the spirit of the Lord is, now isn't there times in scripture where you see Holy Ghost or spirit of the Lord? It's the same thing, right? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. See, liberty, liberty in Christ. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now, here's where I'm going to prove it for you. All right. I just wanted to show the other two times you'll see spirit of Christ in scripture. Go with me because I want y'all to see this. John chapter 16, the gospel of John chapter 16. Look at verse 27. This is going to be a very, very brief rundown of this. Notice Jesus says, For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me. Now, if Jesus is the Father, why would Jesus say, For the Father? Oh, oh wait a minute, I am the Father. Never mind. Do you talk like that? Now, some people would have you believe, well, that's his divine side talking to his human side. Yeah. Give me a break, man. That's two distinct persons. And I got one even better coming up. So just bear with me. For the Father himself loveth you because he have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Wow, that sounds heretical. For y'all listening on YouTube or that are new in this fellowship, listen to my doctrine of the Trinity. It is true. Jesus came out of God. I bet you didn't know that, did you? Yeah, I do believe that. So the early church fathers, by the way, there are some quotations from the early church fathers that you could read that make it sound as if they're Arians. Does anybody know what an Arian is? They don't believe that Jesus is God. It's just a creation. That's that. Yeah, that's 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 close to the truth right there. Yeah, they believe that Jesus was created. Okay. Now, maybe there are some Arians that wouldn't that would deny his divinity. Typically, like Jehovah Witnesses, they believe that he is he is divine, but that he was created. Okay. Arianism is what Jehovah Witnesses hold on to. Maybe there's others out there also. And they believe that Jesus was created by God. Okay. That's that's what Arianism is. And the early church fathers. There are quotations if you don't thoroughly study what they have to say on the topic. And once again, not that they're scripture, and I don't agree with them on everything. But on the Trinity, they were solid as a rock. And by the way, that was well before the Roman Catholic Church. That's why when you're talking to somebody that's oneness and they're like, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, they started the doctrine of the Trinity. It comes from Babylon. Babylon and blah. It's just like immediately it's like ignorance, ignorance. You don't know what you're talking about because it's not true. They were speaking about this well before the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church. So, they make a distinction between the Lagos, some say Logos, Lagos, in fact, in my original Trinity uh, series, I pronounce it as Logos. There's sometimes when it comes to Greek words, some people say it differently than others. Because it's a dead language, it's kind of debatable how you pronounce it. I pronounce it now as Lagos. That's how Blue Letter Bible pronounces it. It's Lagos. He is the Lagos. Now, Lagos isn't something special. In Greek, it just means reasoning or word. Okay? He is the word of God. He is the reason of God. Okay? He, the early church fathers believed, and their script, this scripture proves it. This is one, just one, that he came out from God at some point. This does not mean he was created. He's always been with the Father. But at some point, the Father God brought forth his Lagos. And through his Lagos, his word and reasoning, the Son, i.e. the Son, although the early church fathers would have said he was the Lagos then and they would have equated him to being the Son when he came in the flesh. 
even though he was the son then too. But he was brought forth, and through him everything was made that was made. So the Father God willed it and brought forth his son from his bosom. In fact, you see that terminology in Scripture too. Okay, That's why you'll see things about Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. What does he mean by that? They're one in divine unity. They're one in their essence. Okay, Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost are one. Not one person. One God. One divine essence. Okay, Like me, Jamari, and Dean. We're all of the same nature. Okay, He's not less human than I am. He's not less human than I am. We're all of the same class, the same nature, the same essence. If you want to say same substance. I'm not 100% human and he's 99.99999% human. Okay, he's 100% human also. Dogs would be in a different class, right? They're not human. All right. However, there's distinctions amongst us. I've got white skin. Dean's got kind of reddish, orangish type hair. I do not. I've got a little bit of highlight of that, although I'm going white too. Jamari has black skin. Jamari has a, a, a sh kind of a patchier beard. He has a fuller beard. Okay, Jamari's You see difference in personal attributes. You see difference in headship. I'm the head of them because I'm their pastor. They're under me. But just because they're under me does not make me better than them. I'm still a human, just as they are. That's why you'll see scriptures that talks about when Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. And people try to explain that as, well, that's just when he was in the flesh. But it's not like that now. Really? You may want to go read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You may want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. See, that, that I'm warning you, most people do not understand the Trinity that, are, that, that teach on the Trinity. They don't get it. They'll actually say, well, yeah, he, he, was, he was less than the Father when he was on earth because he took on human flesh, but it's not that way now. Mm -mm, wrong. 1 Corinthians 11. Look at the very beginning of it. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus hands everything back to the Father. If Jesus and the Father God are one person, how is it in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus is handing everything back to the Father? That's two persons. So what? Jesus hands something to the Father, and then he's like, thank you, son. He just transports to, him, to his own self? I mean, that's in the Word of God. He's a shapeshifter. Yeah, he's a shapeshifter, man. That's what he does. I mean, it's just it's nonsense. It really is nonsense. So you see that Jesus himself says, I come out from God. That's what the early church fathers believed, that he came out from the Father. Okay, Not that he was created, not that he was made, not that he never existed with the Father. He's always existed with the Father, so has the Holy Ghost, but he came out from the Father. He brought forth his Lagos, through him everything was made. Okay, like And then look at verse 28, it says, Jesus says, I came forth from the Father. Exactly what I just said. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. If Jesus is the Father, how is he going to himself? This is nonsense. You wanted to say something? Yeah, it's like... Something came forth from God, from His nature. It, it wouldn't be anything but God and divinity. Just like if we were all, all me, Jamari, and Keith were all biological brothers. We came from the same mother. We'd all be the same matrix. We came. From You're the God. same exact nature. You know, we wouldn't. I wouldn't have a dog or the biological. Jesus is not a demigod. Yeah. He is God in the flesh. He is God. But the Father is greater than Jesus. In fact, you could blaspheme God the Father, you could blaspheme Jesus and still go to heaven by repentance. If you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, done. you're done. Now, how is that possible? If the Holy Ghost is God, if there's only one God and you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you're blaspheming the one God. How, why is there a distinction? Because there's a difference. And when you look at uh, 
verse, going down to verse 32, I don't know if you're going down there, but if you look at verse 32, Jesus said, uh, he's not alone because the Father is with him. But if Jesus is the Father, why is Jesus saying he's not alone? Why, Jesus, Aren't you the Father, so it doesn't make you alone? Essentially, they're making Jesus out to be a liar. The Father is with me. What do you mean the Father? You mean the Father is you? Not with you? That's why you got to press the oneness. What does Jesus mean when he says with? What does with mean in English? It applies to people, another person. I don't say Dean is with Dean. Oh, I, I, I've got even, I've got him even, I've got even a better one for you. Go to John chapter 14 real quick. Now, while you guys are there real quick, don't turn. I want to give you guys this real quick. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Okay, remember I just showed you that he came out from God. He came forth from God. And you see Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 that says, For in him, talking about Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, some people will say, I don't like, I don't like saying the word Trinity, which, by the way, I'm a very biblical pastor, so I don't expect any of you to ever use the word Trinity if you don't want to. You obey your conscience. It's not in the Word of God. I don't expect you to use it if you don't want to. I have no problem using it. Just like the, the word Bible is not literally in the Bible, but we use the word. You don't see the word pre-tribulation or post-tribulation, but you see the concept of, well, post-tribulation, not pre. Or rapture. Rapture, right. So I don't have a problem using extra biblical words. I'm just stating that I'm not forcing you guys to use a word that's not in Scripture. But what I, the reason why I address that is some people say, well, I don't want to use the word Trinity. I just want to say, I believe in the Godhead. Just so you understand, I'm not saying this to be nasty, mean, or rude, or anything like that. When you say that, it really sounds uneducated. Okay? I'm not nitpicking. If you want to say it, that's, that's fine. But they're getting it from Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. The Greek for Godhead just literally means deity. So you're saying, I believe in the deity. Godhead is an old archaic English word just simply meaning Godhood. So when you say, well, I don't, I'm not using Trinity. I believe in the Godhead. You're just saying, I believe in the Godhood. Okay. So that's why newer translations will say in verse nine, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of divinity bodily. Cause that's what the Greek word means. All right. Just wanted to instruct you all on that real quick. Back to John chapter 14. Starting in verse 16, it's Jesus, all, all of his words right here, it says, And I will pray the Father, two distinct persons, and he, who's he, the Father, shall give you another comforter. You see three people there. That he, the comforter, may abide with you forever. By the way, every time you see he, you, I, these are called personal pronouns. You only use personal pronouns for people. Okay? This is Jesus' words, not mine. He goes on, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he, the Comforter, dwelleth with you and shall be in you. We're going to keep reading because this is going to prove what the Spirit of Christ is. Notice he says in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Well, how's he going to come to them? Well, let's keep reading. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father. Okay, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Well, I guess we're all just one person now. See what I'm saying? That's not what he's meaning. Now look at this, verse 21. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. If Jesus is the Father, he wouldn't say, you, you shall be loved of my Father. What are you talking about, Jesus? You are the Father. And I, Jesus, will love him and will manifest myself to him. I, Jesus, will manifest myself to him. Distinct from the Father. Verse 23. Let's skip down. 
Jesus says, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Whose words? Jesus' words. And my father. If Jesus is the father, why is he saying my father? And my father will love him and we... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Why does that say we? Notice it says, and we will come unto him. That we will come is in the first person, plural. You can't lie your way out of this if you believe in oneness or modalism. Modalism is that there's one literal God and he manifests in different modes. They're ancient heresies. Why is it in the plural? Literally, I, I can show it's on, it's on the Greek. Why is it in the plural? Because there's three distinct persons, one God. That's why. Jesus is not lying and Jesus is not crazy. So verse 23, Jesus says, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we in the plural. There's no arguing out of this. Jesus, are you saying Jesus is a liar? And we will come unto him and make our abode with him, meaning the Father and the Son are coming to live in you. How does that happen? Remember what he said in verse 18? I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And then in verse 23, he says, the Father and I will make our abode in him. We will live in him. How is that? Verse 24. And he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and now we know for a fact the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, Jesus' name, be baptized in the name of Jesus. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remem remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So how does J Jesus and the Father abode live inside of you? Through the Holy Ghost. Why is that? Go to Acts chapter 5. Why is it and how is it that... The Father God and Jesus live inside of you through the Holy Ghost. How is that possible? I'll show you. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias and with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of land? So who did he lie to? The Holy Ghost, right? All right, verse 4. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own after it was sold? Was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Most of the time in Scripture, if you weren't aware, when you see God, it's actually in reference to the Father. That's true. In fact, you see in the Old Testament, most of the time, when it's talking about the Most High God, that's talking about the Father. Okay? But there, this time, he says, but unto God. So lying to the Holy Ghost, you're lying to God. Why is that? Because the Holy Ghost is God. And the Father God and Jesus, who is God, will live in you through the Holy Ghost, which is God. Good? Okay. Very brief rundown of the Trinity. All right. Go back to Romans chapter 8. In fact, if you want this for your notes, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, you'll also see Jesus say, Spirit of your Father. You can write that down also. That's Matthew chapter 10, verse 20. Jesus himself says, Spirit of your Father. Now, looking at verses 10 through 11 here, it says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So do you notice the distinction in verse 10 there? The distinction being the body is dead because of sin, 
but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And this verse 10 through 11, notice he says in 11, the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that Holy Ghost. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, meaning give life to your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So what does the Holy Ghost bring? Death or life? Life. But you first need to die with Christ to receive life from the Holy Spirit. In fact, this goes with Paul's argument. You can go back real quick to Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So how are you baptized into Christ's death? Water baptism. And I'm going to prove this is water baptism, not Holy Ghost baptism. Therefore, we are buried with him, with Jesus, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So notice verse 3, baptized into Jesus Christ, you're baptized into Jesus' death. What did Jesus do on the cross? He shed his blood. So when you go down in the water and you're buried with Christ, you're baptized into Jesus' death. Death, meaning you receive his blood atonement. That's why so many people don't understand baptism. If they didn't tr first repent, putting their faith in Jesus, it's just wet. You're just a wet sinner. It's just water. But God uses the water as an instrument to bring you together with Christ because you need to go under and be buried in the water with Christ into his death, receiving the blood atonement. That's exactly what that's talking about. Anybody could see that if they wouldn't be taught garbage. Because you don't die receiving the Holy Ghost. We just read a scripture, you have life. Do you die receiving the Holy Ghost? No. You don't die receiving the Spirit. He goes on, verse 4, Therefore we're buried with Jesus by baptism into death. So if that's Holy Ghost baptism, it wouldn't be death. It would be, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into life. It's amazing that educated teachers don't see that. Are you kidding me? It says death. You die. You're buried with Christ by baptism into his death. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together, literally means born together with, in the likeness of his death. How can you be born again? You need to be buried with Christ first. Die. Die with Christ, putting on Christ, coming up, receiving life. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Notice that. That's what we were reading in Romans 8 there. We're crucified with him because you were buried with him. You died. You received Christ's death. You die. You go under. We're crucified with Jesus that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. See, you die in the water, and you're into whose death? Jesus' death in the water. Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, how are you dead with Christ? According to Romans 6, water baptism I mean, this is so simple. It's really elementary. You don't need a theological doctrine to see that. Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, and you're dead with Christ by what? Water baptism. We believe also we shall, be, we shall live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. See, that corresponds exactly with Romans chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. You can go back. So Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 12 now. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Now, what, what does this debtor mean? Well, debtors in the Greek just simply means one who owes another. A debtor. What's the wages of sin? Death. That's the debt that you owe. If you're in sin... The debt that you owe is hellfire for all of eternity. Okay? Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. So who are you a debtor to now? Jesus. You put on Christ. You're his bondservant. In fact, you, you see the apostles call themselves a bondservant of Jesus Christ. 
Okay, you're a slave of Christ. Verse 13, this is a great one right here. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, meaning put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Look at verse 13. Do you all see the condition? It's amazing so many professing Christians do not see the condition. Now, we're not going to... We're not going to go to these scriptures because we've done it many times, even in this uh, Epistle of Romans series. But he says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Well, what's living after the flesh? Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Even Paul said, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Revelation chapter 21, 8, where he shows that these people will be in the second death, the lake of fire. James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. If any of you do err from the truth and someone turn him back, know that him that turns the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death. Because you die if you sin willfully. Revelation 21, 27. Liars, those that are abominable, will not enter the kingdom of God. And even in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7, when Paul wrote that letter, he says, Don't even let it be named once among you as becometh saints. None of those sins that are listed there. Romans, one. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2. I mean, it's all over the New Testament, and it's all over the Old Testament also. So let me ask you something. When it says, If ye live after the flesh, meaning you're walking after the flesh, ye shall die. Here's the question. John's even said this before. How much can you be in the flesh and not die? That's what I'd like to ask these professing Christians that sin all the time. How much can you live in the flesh and not die? Let me ask you something. Like I said before, how many sins did Adam and Eve commit willfully? They willfully knew not to bite of the fruit of that tree Yet they did it anyways. How many sins did it take for them to get kicked out of paradise, out of the Garden of Eden, and be kicked and barred from the tree of life? One willful sin. That's all it took. You're not going to heaven in sin. Period. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Believe God's word. You will die the second death, the lake of fire for all of eternity. Now, he goes on, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. To address Dean's question that he has asked before, um, Dean has asked basically, well, couldn't Romans chapter 6 be both? That this baptism is Holy Spirit baptism in water. Well, when he talks about the fact you are buried with Christ by baptism into death, you're, bapti you're baptized into Jesus in his death by water baptism. And that's why in verse 5 it says, when you're planted together, meaning born together with, in the likeness of his death, meaning you go down, born of water, you come up of spirit. Yeah. So it's the combination of both. You're correct in that sense because the born together is you coming up out of the water, you receive the Holy Spirit of God. But this is different. This is not your first conversion. He's talking to those that are already born again. And he says, but if you through the Spirit do mortify, you put the death of these body, you shall live. As soon as you receive the Holy Spirit of God, you have the power of God to put the death of deeds of the body. But don't, can't you make a willful, conscious decision before you receive the Spirit of God that I'm done with my sin? I'm done with it. I'm done. I want Jesus. That's why you're commanded to repent, which repentance isn't just a turning away from sin. It's coming into full agreement with God in the mind. And it reflects in the life. I'm in a full agreement with God. Whatever God says, that's what I want. So you turn away from everything. You turn in full faith to Jesus Christ being baptized in water, coming up, receiving the Spirit of God, being born again. You can do that like that. It isn't like, okay, I'll make myself better over time, you know, and I'll do it on my own. No, you receive, it's all simultaneous like that. Born of water and spirit. Born of water and spirit. And that's why Acts 2.38 says that. 
Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission, for the forgiveness of sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Water, spirit, born again. For the record, as I've said before, and maybe I'll even post that doctrinal series on the baptism teachings I did underneath the description box of this video. Yes, the Lord can make an exception. It's not a contradiction. You know why? Are you ready for it? Because I don't contradict the word of God. It's not a contradiction if you're not contradicting God. Okay? The Lord can do what he wishes. All right? But you're not going to be saved other than by Jesus. Period. There's no other way. So, hopefully that helps you there. And notice he says in verse 14, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Huh. Led by the Spirit of God. Well, you don't have to turn there. I'll read these to you. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, if you're following Jesus, would Jesus lead you into sin? No. Because John chapter 12, verse 26 says this. Jesus says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am... There shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Once again, if Jesus is the father, how does the father honor that person if Jesus is the father? Right? On top of that, notice Jesus says, where I am, my servant will be. Is Jesus ever in sin? So if you're in sin, are you in Jesus? No. No. You need to repent and get back to following Jesus. It's, it's like, this is not complicated. It's very, very, it's simple. It's, it's, the, it's the elementary faith. You can't be in sin and be serving God at the same time. So those are the sons of God, those that are following Jesus. Now look at verse 15 here. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, what is he talking about with this bondage? You don't have to turn there, because we read it before. Here's one Bible verse. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death... He, Jesus, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. They were subject to this bondage of death. And really, you can make an argument, it's, it's two deaths. One, physical death. Jesus had to conquer the grave so we can conquer the grave through Jesus. And number two, also, without Jesus, you're damned. You need the blood atonement of Christ. Literally for him to ransom you from the devil, from the power of your sins, so he can give you the spirit through his resurrection, but also to cleanse you from sin. Okay? So that's the bondage. The next one here is Abba, Father. What does that mean? What does that mean? It is used two other times in scriptures. I'm not going to read that, but two other times in scripture it says, and it says Abba, Father, and Jesus talks that way to his father in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, and Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. So it's used two other times. Jesus himself even said, Abba, Father. What does Abba, Father mean? Well, it's, it's two Greek words. Well, Abba is in the Greek, although it is of Aramaic origin. It's an Aramaic term. Abba simply means Father. Now, they do explain it, and they are correct about this. It says, customary title used of God in prayer. Whenever it occurs in the New Testament, it has the Greek interpretation joined to it that is apparently to be explained by the fact that the Chaldee Abba, through frequent use in prayer, gradually acquired the nature of a most sacred proper name. Notice it's a most sacred proper name. Because so many people, they'll say, oh, it just means Daddy, Father. Yeah, but it's not like some flippant, like, oh, daddy, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, you'll, you'll, I'll explain it in a moment, but it's, it's sacred. It's, this is, this is my father. The, yes, we are to be children, but I, 
I don't want people being flippant with this thing where they, they just think it's some nonchalant word, okay? It's like deep endearment, right? Yeah, it is. A, I, and a, Right. I'm going to explain that in a moment. It goes on, through frequent use in prayer, gradually acquired the nature of a most sacred proper name, to which the Greek-speaking Jews added the name from their own tongue. And what Adam said there is perfect. Abba just simply means, in layman's terms, it's a term that signifies a close, intimate relationship between a child and his father. It's not necessarily religious, okay? I'll give you some scripture to think about this. Um, Mark chapter 10, verse 13, starting in verse 13, but I'm going to read verse 14 where Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And Jesus says the same thing again in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, about the fact we need to be like children, little children. Think about a little child. You guys are about to have one. You know, when your child's coming up and can communicate, that child has a close bond to you. And they're putting all their trust in you. This child cannot survive without you. And in that sense, think of daddy, father. It's not some flippant like, yeah, he's my daddy. <laughs> it's a reverent like, daddy, father, I need you now. It's an intimate closeness with God. And remember this when you're in prayer with God. Okay? Spill your heart to Him. Pour yourself out before God. He is your Father. You know other religions do not have this closeness with God. Have you ever spoken to a Muslim? They can't comprehend this. This is a close intimacy with God because we are children of God. So hopefully that explanation really helps for you. Back to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. He goes on and says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And he's correlating that to the Abba Father. You, have, you are able to say this because you are in that closeness, that oneness with God. And remember what we read earlier from Jesus where, where he was basically saying, I am in the Father and you and me and we're all one. That like we read that so flippantly and we don't, it's like we don't get it. We're one with God. Not some heretical idea like, oh my God, no, oh, and I'm deity, not none of that garbage. We're one in closeness with God, of the same mind, the same character. God doesn't sin. You saw the fruits of the Spirit in this sermon. We walk just like Him. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, notice the condition, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, which continues in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm paraphrasing it, but it says that come out from among the world and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not. He says, says the Lord. And the Lord goes on to, says, to say that don't touch what is unclean and I will receive you. How can you be sinning against God, coming to God, still sinning? That's a condition. You can't still be touching your unclean things and say, Oh, Jesus, I'm really coming to you. Will I bring my baggage of sin with me? Can I keep this? Now you got to let go. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And he goes on and says, I will walk in them and dwell among them. I will be their God and they shall be my children. That closeness. Whoever fears and, and works righteousness is accepted of them. It's, a, it's parallel. That's right. At 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, you guys can go to this one. 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 1. This, this is a real test right here. John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. This goes with the Abba Father. This goes with this closeness with God. 
that we should be called the sons of God. Not just children of God, you're sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Boy, listen to this heretical statement coming up next in verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So when you first come to Christ, and this will help you out even more, Dean, with the Romans chapter 6 thing, you have to purify yourself first. How do you do that? Can you cleanse yourself of sin? You cleanse your hands from your sin in this sense. I'm done. Let go of it and turn to Jesus. You are turning to Jesus as a sinner, letting go of it. Purifying himself even as Jesus is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of law. You know that he was manifested. Jesus was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He takes it away. He removes it. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. He does not sin. Hath not seen him, neither known him. And notice what he says next. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, Jesus, is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. So if you commit sin, you're of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning, and he tells you, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's the reason why Jesus came in the flesh. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And look at verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. If you're not doing what is right, you're not of God. He literally said, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. So if you're not doing what is right, you're not of God, period. And then look down in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed. The Greek root word is ergon. Other, other way you could translate it is works. But in works and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So how do you assure your heart before God? You're doing in your works and in truth, not just in your tongue. Okay? And look at verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. So you have confidence towards God if your heart does not condemn you. The devil is not condemning you. The devil wants you to sin. That's God telling you to stop and to repent if you are sinning. Of course, we know 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. I want you guys to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. You know, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, you know, he that, keeps it, he that does not keep his commandments is, the law, is a liar. If you're not doing what Jesus tells you to do, you are a liar. You do not know him. And if you abide in him, you're going to walk as Jesus walked. Hebrews chapter 12. And we went here because... Remember what we read in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17, where it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And I went to Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 5, because this shows you who's the son, and as the King James would say, who the bastard is, the one that is fatherless. Okay? Now, there are many people that do not sincerely, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say there are people out there that sincerely misunderstand this in Hebrews chapter 12. Because they read this and they say, well, see, we're sinning all the time. We're getting rebuked by God, so you're sinning, so you're a child. 
So we're going to walk through this very quickly. I'm going to give you the very quick synopsis of this, all right? Verse 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. I want to stop for a moment. You'll see primarily two different Greek root words used extensively through these next few verses here, starting in with um, verse 5. You'll see paideia, the Greek root word, and paiduo. Paideia literally means the whole training and education of children. Also, whatever an adult also cultivates to the soul, especially by correcting mistakes and curbing passions. Of course, they explain it, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with the explanation, like instruction, which aims at increasing virtue, chastisement, chastening of the evils with which God visits men for their amendment. But it literally means training, discipline, instruction, okay? People see this chastening, it could have been translated as, my son despise not the instruction of the Lord, or the training of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he instructs, or trains, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, that scourgeth in Greek, it literally means to scourge. I don't disagree with that. Let me help you guys as we read these next few verses. Have you ever, I mean, I have many times. Have you sinned ignorantly since being a Christian? Like you do something and afterwards, you know, it could be days later. You're in prayer or maybe it's during the day and the Lord's like, you know, Keith, you could have said that better. And it's like, oh, I need to repent of that. I, I, could, have, I could have said that better. But at the time, you didn't see anything wrong with it, right? That's a sin of ignorance. The Lord's bringing it to your attention. Is that not chastening? Is he not scourging you? That proves you're a child of God. Okay. Now, you can't just hold on to that and say, well, that definitely proves it. Because guess what? Sinners can get convicted by God and they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. Okay. But that's part of the test. You have to take this with 1 John chapter 3 and many other scriptures to prove if you're a child of God or not. Okay. Now, he goes on, verse 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is, whom, is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Meaning, he's not your father. Okay? But remember, we have to take the totality of Scripture. Didn't Jesus say when the Comforter comes, when the Holy Ghost, He's going to convict the world, reprove the world of sin, judgment, and righteousness? So does the Holy Ghost convict sinners? Can they feel bad about their sin? Does that mean they're a child of God? Nope. Aren't they being chastened by God to a degree? They're at least being told you need to repent. Right? So you can't just hold on to this and be like, well, see, I'm sinning all the time. I'm right with God. See right there, he's chastening me. If you're sinning all the time, what does 1 John 3, 8 say? He that commits sin is of the devil. That's why when people go to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5, uh, the verses 5 through 11 here, and they try to make an argument that, well, see, you're getting chastised and corrected because you're sinning all the time. It's like, What? You could be sinning, yeah, sure, ignorance. Doing things in ignorance, and the Lord is instructing you and training you. I, we have grown so much since we first started off, have we not? Has God not chastened us about things? Has God not scourged us about things? Oh, I know He has with me. I'm admitting it on camera. And at the time, I may have thought I was right about something, and God's like, you know, you, you could have done that better. Oh, man, I need to repent, God. And if I did it to somebody, I'd go to that person too. So that, that's how you need to read this. He goes on. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Notice that. 
He's instructing you to be partakers of His holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Did you pick up on that little word there? Exercised thereby. Exercised, huh? That's interesting. That exercised in Greek is from the Greek root word gumnadzo. The Greek root word. You know what that Greek root word looks like? Gym. Now, I'm not going to give the full etymology on this word. I have an etymology app. In a long chain of events, we do get our English word gym from this word. Gumnadzo is from gumnas, and gumnas means properly unclad without clothing the naked body. So, like our word gym has obviously morphed and has evolved over time, but that's from gumas. Now, this Greek word used here, the Greek root word gumnadzo, literally means to exercise naked, to exercise vigorously in any way, either the body or the mind. So it can mean, because it's rooted in that word that, that has a nakedness to it. So this Greek root word gumnadzo, which is from gumnos, can mean to exercise naked or to exercise vigorously in any way, either the body or the mind. And when you look at the transliteration of that word, it looks like gym, which is where we get our English word long train of events, gym. Remember what I told you about this? It's instruction and training. And guess what? That proves it there unto them which are exercised thereby. You're being trained. You're being instructed in the ways of the Lord. In fact, to prove it even more, if you would read verses 1 through 4, it proves it even more because he tells you literally to lay apart Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares you, besets you. And you have not resisted against sin that much. You know, you have not yet resisted on the blood striving against sin. He literally says that. He says, ye have not resisted on the blood striving against sin, not failing. Striving against sin is struggling, fighting. If you're sinning, you're failing. You're giving into it. Okay? So hopefully that helps. Um, I'll probably have a longer sermon on it, maybe when I teach on the doctrine of man and sin, because that's one that many people, these verses, they unfortunately they misunderstand. Now back to Romans chapter 8, to conclude the last part of verse 17. Notice it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, notice the condition, if so be that we suffer with Him that we may be also glorified together. Notice there's a condition. Notice it says, if so be that we suffer with him. What if you choose not to suffer with Christ? You're not the Lord's then. There are many scriptures on this. I'll read a couple here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, see the sufferings of Christ, they abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. There's one scripture. You've got 2 Timothy chapter 3. Starting in verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, and Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
If you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. We have suffered it, and many godly people do. Many people, there have been people out there that speak evil against us, that say things that are inaccurate. They don't even try to understand our position about things. I've seen it with my own eyes because they misrepresent what we're, say, what we're stating. Or they just falsely accuse. But take joy in it. Great is your reward if you have good fruit. And he even warns you in verse 13, he says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And if you go to 1 Peter chapter 4, it's amazing in Peter's epistles how much he talks about suffering with Christ. I was kind of amazed by that when I was wrapping this sermon up, writing this down. It's like, wow, Peter sure does talk a lot about suffering with Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You stopped sinning. That's a great Bible verse to preach, by the way. That he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, remember, riotous behavior, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. See, we don't act like the world. We don't run with the world. In the same chapter, verse 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, that seems to have happened to us, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Remember what Jesus said, Who's ever is ashamed of me and my words, you need to believe the words of Jesus. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or an evildoer, or a busybody in other men's matters. So he tells you, don't suffer in that way. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. If it begin with us first, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You'll see another case of suffering in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18-25. through 25. Notice he says, servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffer suffering wrongfully. Notice if you're enduring grief and you're suffering wrongfully, do, do you have a joyous heart in it? That's a real test, man. I'm telling you. It can be a real test for you when you're being wronged and to take it. That's part of carrying your cross. It don't feel good, does it? <laughs> I know it don't feel good for me either. But you grow in it. Do you think it felt good for Jesus being on that cross? No, it didn't. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye you shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin. So follow that step, no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. He didn't revile back to them. When he suffered, he threatened not. He didn't threaten them but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He committed himself to God the Father. 
who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, see, dead to sin, you're not still doing it, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So, you'd be amazed at how much scripture there is on suffering. <clears throat> and I'll probably have a thorough teaching on it in the future. It's part of the Christian walk. So going back to Romans chapter 8, as we conclude this, you see that you're, if you're a child of God, you're heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if, condition, if so be that you suffer with him. So with that, any men have anything they want to add? Any questions, any objections? Yeah, so I just want to say a wonderful teaching again, brother. Very good sermon. Definitely led by the Spirit of God. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. And it definitely, yeah, it definitely taught me a lot about, you know, walking, you know, in the Lord. I mean, you know, even as I was a babe in Christ, you know, I still had that understanding of, you know, like, sin is something that, you know, we should die to. Now, when I was being led in my beginning walk, I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos and I watched a lot of YouTube shorts and a lot of them definitely had a lot of Calvinistic teachings in it. You know, like, one saved, always saved. You can't lose your salvation. Yep. It's all um, over the place. I mean... I don't think they, I mean, they did say, like, you should turn from sin, but that he was like, even if you did sin, like, oh, God still loves you, you know, and stuff like that. And I used to believe that for some time, but then, like, as I began to watch, like, preaching videos, and people were going, like, against that, saying, like, no, that's not biblical, and I was like, okay, maybe I should start looking into that, and I started looking into the scriptures. I saw, like, I don't know, man, I mean, the Bible's saying what it's saying, I mean... Mm -hmm. Yes, there is definitely the love of God. You know, we can have assurance of salvation, but the assurance of salvation is sinning, sinning over and over again, and the grace of God is just like an umbrella, and it just covers it. The grace of God and the assurance of God is this. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. If you have His power, you have access to His power, and every single time when you're tempted to sin, you have a way out, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You have a way out. What sin that you're doing that you can't really stop doing? I mean, there's even things in our life that we do not even just relating to like spiritual things, but even physical things. There are things that we're doing, we can be addicted to that we can just stop. Like me, it was soda. Right. I was addicted to drinking soda. I love soda. Pepsi, Coca-Cola, 7 or Sprite, I don't care what it is. If carbonate, carbonated, give it to me. <laughs> right. So, right. So I was addicted to drinking soda, but then after I found out it could cause kidney stones, and it was like, it's very unhealthy. That, that freaked me out. That screamed me so much. <laughs> I was just like, I'm just going to stop drinking soda. Yeah. And I did it. I stopped drinking soda. And now... I'll be honest with you, brother. I don't have no temptation to drink soda. Sometimes I'll even look at soda and I'll even be kind of a little disgusted. Like, hey, I should do that? Mm. Drink that? But now it's just like, all I want is water. Just water, nothing but water. And so, if I'm able to do that with these earthly things, how much more should I not do with the spiritual things? Right. Why can't I do the same thing with sin? Right. Stop sinning. Stop doing the things which God detests and look at it like disgusting. Because like, that's what the Bible says. You're supposed to look at sin like you detest it. You hate it. But you're supposed to look at righteousness like, I love it. I want some more. So I can always use that analogy. Like, Jamari, think about your, when you used to drink soda, how you hate now and detest soda, and now you love water more. Hate sin, love righteousness even more. Right. Now, I'm not, again, putting down no one who drinks soda. It's just fine right, for you to drink right, soda. Right. But, but I'm just saying for my case, this helps me with my fight against temptation. Like, <laughs> Jamari, if you're able picture. to do, do these things, you're able to stop doing this, and now you're doing this. Why can't you do the same thing with God when it comes to sin, stop sinning? You can also do it with holiness, too. Right. And so this teaching helps us to, you know, clarify some things about what does this verse really mean? What does this chapter mean? What does the context mean? Because anytime when you're dealing with the Word of God, you can't handle it deceitfully or mishandle it. Right. Well, we got to be like in 2 Timothy. We have to be workers of God who need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word, word of truth. truth. That's right. Rightly. No, no such as rightly dividing the word of truth. Yep. Amen. What does Second Peter say? Some twist the word of God mm -hmm. to their own destruction. And we see that many times. You go all the YouTube videos, Reformed theology, evangelical, mm -hmm. evangelical theology, Calvinistic theology, oneness theology, Mormon knowledge, all this stuff, all twisting the word of God. And these people, some of these people, they've been doing this for, like for years. They have theological degrees. They've done like many debates. So and people would say like, "Oh, these people are like very like uh, experienced." Okay, but you're still tripping on even the most basic things. Yep. I don't care how experienced you are. I don't care if you have twenty or thirty years, or even if you have fifty years in a field. If you're getting the basics messed up, 
doesn't mean it, it, it your work means nothing i'll just be honest it means nothing right. because you're sending you're deceiving people you're sending them to hell yeah unfortunately sending people to hell if you're not even getting the basics right i don't i don't care if you have a piece of paper right. i don't care same thing with me right i just like at matthew 7 1 judge not lest you be judged i apply the same thing to me too if I get a theological degree and I'm in an area for many years, but I'm tripping up on the basic things, I expect to be rebuked. Right. Because, hey, even sometimes people have been in a field for many times, they can even get the basics wrong. Amen. So that's that's why the walk of God is not just, oh, look at me, look at how long I've been doing this for. It's, it's a life of reflection. It's knowing that, yes, you know, get the basics right, but also, you know, look at yourself in truth, because maybe we might stumble. There may be ignorance. There may be ignorance for all, but the question is, are you willing to look at it in humbleness and say, I'm going to give this to God and I'm going to repent. I'm going to seek the truth. I'm going to seek the knowledge. Or am I just going to stand my ignorance? Because it's much better to be in my ignorance, much better to be in my bubble, much better to be where my feelings are rather than where the truth is. Is our truth held in our feelings, which aren't forever and will perish after a certain time? Is our feelings based upon the truth and slash and endures forever in the word of God? which endures forever. Jesus says the grass fades and the flowers wither, but the word of God endures forever. I'm going to yep. put my truth in the word of God and not in my feelings, not in my own perception of my quote-unquote interpretation of the truth, but simply what is the truth? What is simply the truth and what it is? That's what I'm going to stick to. So again, very good teaching, brother. You know, like very wonderful. And I really hope that this inspires people to like, you know, seek the truth for themselves. Don't just, you know, Again, I'm not saying nothing wrong with, you know, going to church and hearing, being taught by your pastor. God gives people to be teachers. Right. But First Thessalonians 5.21, test all things. You got to test it, man. You got to test it. <clears throat> First John 4.1, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit of their God. I'm not saying your pastor may be wrong, but check it up. Yeah, absolutely. What does it say? Be a brain. With scripture. Be a brain in yep. Acts 17. Right. Yep. So. Amen. Hey, God Praise bless, God, man. God bless to the uh, sermon. That's wonderful. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to see it next week. You know, next sermon we give. Um, there's many people that twist that, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, I, once again, now that we're getting into the latter half of Romans chapter 8, with what people call the golden chain of redemption, how anybody could believe that Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 23, is the Christian walk, when you start back in Romans chapter 6 and read it all the way to Romans chapter 8, verse 17, how you could ever come to the conclusion that's the Christian walk. It's just, it's just handling the Word of God deceitfully. Now, you could be doing it ignorantly, but for those that are older in the faith and you're doing that, that's handling the Word of God deceitfully, man. Whether you're knowingly doing it or you're just that ignorant, I don't know. But it's just not accurate. It's not, it's not accurate. So... Any other men? Till next week.